Can we jump to the PM? He was open and transparent. You, you talk about people of faith uh, uh, in Australia today. There's some very interesting stories there. The book's worth writing, re re buying. Just skip over the chapter about me, but um, uh, some fascinating people have done, have done and are doing extraordinary things. You've got the Prime Minister, General Cosgrove, former Governor General, Bill Hayden. It's amazing modesty and honesty that comes through uh, uh, in Bill Hayden's uh, words and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but the PM, you can't help liking him. Whether you agree with him or not, he's open and he's transparent and he's honest and he's modest. They're all qualities that we traditionally uh, admire. So I want to say uh, one up for the PM in the way that he comes out of your book. I found the Prime Minister very frank and open. There was no question that I asked him that he was reluctant to answer. And I think he handles the public dimension of his faith very well. Doesn't try to ram it down anyone's throat but he doesn't run away from who he is. He's inspired by his Christianity, but his Christianity doesn't tell him what he should do about fiscal policy or whether he should regulate, uh, deregulate the labour market uh, or anything like that. And that's precisely where I wanted to go now because I don't think I'm misquoting him when he made the accurate observation that the Bible's not a policy handbook. However, to go back to our earlier discussion, you touched on Paul. Uh, and universalism. Can we explore that for a moment? Because it does seem to me that whilst the Bible is patently obviously not a political handbook, it's not a party political handbook, it's not a policy handbook, it is profoundly political in the influence that it has. Now, you said that Paul reset the way we think. Can you describe how that happened? He committed uh, uh, us to think carefully about universalism. As Menzies put it, all souls equal in the eyes of heaven. So, I may disagree with you, but I have a responsibility to recognise that a higher authority says you matter as much as I do. That's a pretty useful way for a politician to think about his opponents. And it might be useful for people in an age of identity politics to recognise if they have any concept of a higher being, that he might have a different view of your enemy to the one that you have. Uh, but let's just explore for a moment. It seems to me that in a whole range of ways, um, Christianity has been profoundly political. And then we'll come to another religion, which is communism, if you accept that it's a religion after that. But think of just some of the big picture things. The whole idea of universalism, that um, Jack's as good as his mate, uh, that there's no division between men and women, between Greek nor Jew, that's racism, of course, uh, uh, or between master and slave, um, all one in, in Christ. It has been a Christian understanding of, of the nobility and of the failings and the weaknesses of human beings that has led us to find this model, it seems to me. And it's therefore, it's a long-winded way of saying, isn't it the book, in fact, a profoundly political one? Well, that's right, John. Uh, so again, these are complex and difficult waters. Um, I do think human rights is part of the a central part of the whole Jewish and Christian tradition. So the universalism of God is evident even in the Old Testament. The great first statement in the ancient world for human rights is in the book of Genesis, that humanity is created in the likeness and image of God. That was not the, uh, the understanding of humanity before then. And um, even in a book like uh, Jonah, uh, you know, God tells Jonah to preach to the Ninevites who are not Jewish. So God is the God of the Ninevites. There are many instances in the Old Testament that make it clear that the God of the Jews in the Old Testament is the universal God of all mankind. And um, there are passages in the Old Testament uh, which say that, you know, there, there, there will be a light for the Gentiles and so on. It's more explicit in the New Testament, but the universalism of God and the universalism of human rights is evident even in the Old Testament. Now, I agree with you about universalism and human rights. They emerge organically out of Christianity. And therefore, I believe when you ditch Christianity, you're going to find it very hard to sustain those values. I had a, um, a debate on Q&A with the atheist philosopher, Peter Singer. I admire Peter Singer. He's a very fine person, a very fine philosopher. He's a very useful philosopher because he thinks ideas through to their logical conclusion. I was taxing him on this episode of Q&A about a position he argued in a book that uh, handicapped children whose parents don't want to look after them should simply be allowed to die and should not be given medical intervention. And I was disagreeing with him. And he said, Greg, 
Do you really believe they should be kept alive simply because they're members of our species? And I said, yes, that is exactly what I believe, that being human beings means they have an inherent human dignity. Now, that is entirely an idea which emerges out of Christianity. And when you get completely post-Christian, so that you are totally cut off from the roots of Christianity, you then will get, in a very civilised way by people like Singer, and in a very crude way by other people, a rejection even of the universality of humanity, so that the old, the frail, the sick, the handicapped, anyone we don't like, is regarded as less than human. And a final point I'd make, John, responding to your profound and interesting reflections. I agree that Christians ought to be able to draw more explicitly on their values in public life. And Bob Hawke did in a, in a peculiar way. He, he once made a very powerful speech in which he said, surely the fatherhood of God implies the brotherhood of man. And, uh, you know, I think Hawke was absolutely right. Um, I guess two things have militated against it. One is the uh, new anti-Christian secularist environment, which means everybody else is allowed to draw on their life experience and express their values, but not a Christian. The only Christian acceptable in public life now is a social justice Christian, and preferably one who denies all the church's teachings on life issues. The church is uncompromising on life issues. So you can't kill innocent babies. You can't kill innocent older people. Um, and the churches are right to be uncompromising on those issues. The other thing though, I'd say, um, I don't wanna kind of validate the left here, but I do think in the United States, certain politicians are too ready to identify their particular policies with Christianity. So Christianity does give you very clear principles. You must be kind to people. You must treat your opponents with human dignity. You must treat everyone with human dignity. It doesn't tell you whether you should fight poverty by giving more welfare or by deregulating the labor market so that more people get jobs and so on. And some American politicians are a bit inclined to say, uh, you know, unless you support my tax cuts, you are an agent of godless socialism or something. And this, this kind of gives Christianity a bad reputation to, to identify Christianity with what is merely your own policy position. This happens in Australia much more on the left now than the right. A left-wing Christian is much more inclined to say, anybody who doesn't agree with my policy on you know, uh, open borders or something is against Christianity. Whereas a legitimate ethical Christian question is, how do we welcome the stranger, but stop people from drowning at sea and at the same time protect our own sovereignty? So I end up with a position which says, let's have a big refugee intake but let's police our borders securely. Some left-wing Christians say, unless you have open borders, you are not a good Christian. I don't think we should get into that. And I know you're not remotely suggesting that. I don't think we should get into that practice, but I do think Christian politicians ought to be able to access, explain and talk about the Christian inspiration of their, uh, of their overall public policy position. I think it's almost impossible for you to leave your worldview, if you like, at the cabinet door, the way one of my cabinet colleagues suggested ought to happen when we were in government. I don't think you can do it. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.